Hey folks, it's uh, 6.21 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February the 2nd, 2022 years, your guess is as good as mine, or not, because uh, the more information I come by, the smaller and smaller that window of time that I believe is reasonable to believe exists it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and there are things that i'm coming to realize after having put all that time into researching and writing and producing uh, bringing it all together i had not realized before and it involves some really interesting ideas, um, concepts that people have already started talking about. And so I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to run over an idea herein and then talk a little bit about language, terminology, words, why words matter. Words are so important um how we understand something a concept if we misunderstand a concept based on bad terminology how damaging that is and i hope once you all begin to appreciate that or if you do already appreciate that I hope what you'll do is you'll see the damaging effects in the use of bad terminology and you'll start marking the people who routinely use bad terminology. And I hope a lot of you, let me put it to you this way, um, now I'm not saying this because I, I think so much of myself but there's some facts one fact is there's no one doing the kind of research with the kind of perspective that I am no one I wish that wasn't the case in part because I don't want to be the star of the show. Now, let's say that um, I, I'm working on a number of um, designs and models to try to make what I'm doing far more comprehensive, comprehensible, coherent. Coherent. Make it more coherent. Because uh, I have had criticism of how a lot of it's a bit incoherent just because I've had to go in so many different directions. Because as I've explained in the past, it's really difficult to only focus on one topic, one category. I'm, I'm only going to focus on language. But you miss so much if you don't focus on history, if you don't understand geography, if you don't understand peoples, if you don't understand kinds, if you don't understand science, if you don't understand archaeology, if you don't understand literature, if you don't understand the way that the power establishment um, deceives the way they go about it, how they manage to accomplish these things, then just studying language, it could, you know, make you an interesting niche. You're just not going to get as far. But let me bring this back around. So I'm not uh, lauding my great importance, but I am saying this. For all of those who believe in what I'm doing, either in its manifestation now or in its potential to continue to manifest very well. I would suggest to you that just like the people who send donations which help tremendously because that 
every donation helps to free up my time to do more of this because I have responsibilities like any adult man does. Not just that, but sharing. Now, you know, a lot of people, almost everybody, who's trying to build a social media presence, YouTube, whatever, of course, they're always going to say, like and share, like and share, like and share, because they're trying to build themselves up, their brand. Um, because they want to profit from it. Uh, well, in a similar way, I want to profit from this. Um, in the sense of seeing you profit from this. Seeing more of you out there. Um, perusing the ideas that I present to you. Discussing them. Trying to look into these things yourself. Using what tools I can produce to get further down the road or discover things that I haven't. I want you to profit. And one of the ways, yeah, sure, not everybody has a propensity to do a lot of things, but you'd be surprised. Any one of you would be surprised if you just put your mind to doing something, how far you could get. You'd be shocked. If you knew my backstory, where I come from, <laughs> you'd be surprised. So, um, and maybe, maybe someday I'll actually, I'll tell you my backstory because it's, it's interesting. One of the big ways that you can, uh, help if you believe in this is by putting this, the, the content that I produce, the ideas that I'm talking about in front of other people, especially the people out there who are claiming that they're truth tellers in any genre, whatever. That's one of the best things you can do. If people want me to get on Myth Vision and talk to that guy Derek on Myth, Myth Vision, I've sent him a cordial email with links to bringing it all together. Um, haven't heard back. It hasn't been that long. Of course, I only released Bringing It All Together a few weeks ago. Okay. But if, um, if you want to see that, you want to see this spread a little bit further, you get on there and you start talking about it. You start talking about what I'm doing. You know, um, I put all the links of of pretty much all the sites uh, that I'm on, social media sites as far as video, in the description of all my videos. Um, plus, I have a Facebook group I maintain with a few hundred, well, it's about 230 or so members right now, which I just started a few weeks ago too, called the Obery Project Panoply. That link's in the description too. That's one of the best ways you can do is just share and share and share and share and share this stuff. So, a couple of interesting things two things. And I am going to try to make this video shorter than yesterday, uh, if I can. But if I can't, that's the way it goes. Two things, and it involves proper terminology and why it is so important and why I have had trouble in the past. It's part of the reason so many things that I do, talks like this, impromptu, whatever, can be so long-winded because Unfortunately, things aren't as simple as I'd like them to be. I can't just use the common terminology that we've been, that they've just forced on us to communicate to you ideas in the most correct way, the most effective way. It's unfortunate, but it's true. Let me start with this. I was going to go into a little bit about terminology, which I'll get to. But let me start with this, because I have it up on my screen. And if you'll notice, a lot of you, I'm sure, have noticed, 
if I start out with a document <laughs> and you think I'm going to go through that document, think again. Unfortunately, here's, well, here's what happens. Maybe not unfortunately. If I read a document, I'll read the document through, I'll pick out certain key points and those I will see as the core. And so I might actually just take one sentence or a little bit of core something from this and mostly I'm going to expound on it from my perspective. That's why I'll, I'm either going to read copy as in I'm going to narrate a document or a book or something or I'm just going to take little teeny parts of something and I'm going to expound on it. So this I'm going to read a little bit more of. This is again from <laughs> Wikipedia. Um, of course, the most trusted source out there. We all know that. <laughs> but, again, Wikipedia is always going to give us a really good idea of what the status quo is. For better or worse, truth or not. This is the Wikipedia page on Limited Hangout. Now, all of us have heard other people use that term limited hangout for a good reason um, a lot of very untrustworthy people use the term limited hangout but very few of them go into what it is why it's used how it's used how we can identify one and once we identify that we can then ask ourselves why is this person this organization whatever why are they participating in or promoting a limited hangout a clear limited hangout something that has all of the signs characteristics features of a limited hangout why are they doing that and then we can start calling these people out on it in the sense we can we can ask them a lot of these people you can get a hold of pretty easily, either by email or, or other ways. I do this. I ask people I know that are out there in the you know, public space, why are you promoting this? Don't you think there's something wrong with this? And I remember what their answers are to me, whether they're satisfactory or not. A limited hangout, according to Wikipedia. Or... A partial hangout now that's that's maybe a little bit more you know helps you to understand it a little bit or a partial hangout is according to former special assistant to the deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency Victor Marchetti quote spy jargon for a favorite or frequently used gimmick of the clandestine professionals spy jargon it's frequently used gimmick spy jargon for a frequently used gimmick of clandestine professionals so people who are professional deceivers when their veil of secrecy is shredded and they can no longer rely on a phony cover story to misinform the public Start thinking about some things that you've witnessed the last few years or so. So that they can no longer misinform the public, they resort to admitting, sometimes even volunteering some of the truth while still managing to withhold the key and damaging facts in the case. The public, however, is usually so intrigued by the new information that it never thinks to pursue the matter further. Wow. How many things can you think of right now, going on right now, that qualify? as a limited hangout or partial hangout. Some ways to identify it, because all of us are at different stages in how well we are able to critically think about 
a number of things. I'm still at the stage where sometimes others will bring things to my attention. They might point out um, a hypocrisy in something I'm saying, or they might point out something that I completely missed. And it helps to fill those things in. Some people are at the stage where they know something's wrong. They may know something's wrong with a lot of things. They may know something's wrong with just the things that are starting to hurt, right? So a lot of people are realizing that there's something very wrong with the establishment narrative right now concerning viruses and their dangers and, you know, the testing used to determine and if that's even scientific and why isn't there a control and why is it the Journal of American Medical Association used to say that masks were ineffective up until about April of 2019 and then they completely changed their story 180 and started saying but they well yeah it can be effective sometimes so even the you know normie that's the best term really they're starting to uh, catch on just to that because that's starting to hurt and it's starting to hurt in a way where it's it's more difficult for them to sort of forget about it like a lot of other things people can forget it doesn't take too much it doesn't take too much man it, some comfort food uh you know some good tv programming sex sex drugs and rock and roll you know it doesn't take too much but this this is harder for them to ignore because it's making here's what it's doing it's making their lives a pain in the ass that's why they're paying attention i started paying attention to a lot of this because nothing ever added up I was very smart. I could be a very good student, but I was a terrible student. I was a troublemaker in class. Teachers hated me from the youngest age. They hated me. Why? Because it always felt lacking, wrong, incorrect. That was me, but I was an intuit. I couldn't articulate what was wrong, but I into it was my intuition wasn't right and so I would act out on it okay that's why I finally came to the point where I'm at and started on this years ago it's not because I'm not a great intellect well I, ne I never was no I mean I was smart I, I could retain information I was talented I, I was an artist and musician born that way really and developed it throughout my life but I I didn't have any critical thinking skills at at all. So all of us are in different phases of being able to, to think critically or not. And here's the thing, a really effective agent, an enemy of the truth, someone really good at it, really effective. They will use methods. They will use very effective methods of video, written word, spoken word, um, memes, images, to, and then we, we would get into, of course, another um, piece of probably spy jargon, and that would just be the gatekeeper. It's what they do. So the, the funny thing is a limited hangout actually functions in a lot of different ways. A limited hangout can be a honey trap. A lot of people are familiar with that. Uh, a, a limited hangout usually involves gatekeepers, and they gatekeep information. That's part of the whole, you know, idea of limited hangout. They gatekeep that information, and it's really important. And you have to understand that there are these things that you can look for. You, you know, all right. So let's take the. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know if they're going to say that this isn't you know, monetizable, but if they do, screw it. Take the whole COVID argument. And you have, 
you have them on both sides now. What you need to do is pay attention to who, what sort of people are on both sides of this topic. It's one good clue. It's not the only clue. It's like with the names, with titles that we went over a few times back. You've got to look for a few good, strong points. You can't just say, you know, too many people jump to that because they don't have strong, uh, well-developed <clears throat> critical thinking skills. And I was doing the same thing years ago. Y you see one thing, and all of a sudden that's, that's the whole argument against somebody because there's one weird thing you have to look for there's going to always be a number of weird things you know you can't have somebody who has a name that is a very sketchy name that has a lot of ties to occult things fraternal things so on and so forth so on and so forth but everything they teach is right on the money you can verify it over and over and over and over okay well then the problem is you know, maybe they have a name or title or something like that, which is unfortunate because it has potentially a lot of ties to, you know, these things that aren't so good. But you can't, you can't pin them down on their teaching. You can't pin them down on bad associations, let's say. You, you have to have, you know, you have to have evidence. You have to have a few good strong points against somebody. It's the same thing with this. Um, you want to look for, you know, a few points about somebody or about a certain argument that gives it sort of this weight of being fishy. And I believe exactly what we're seeing and a lot of the information that we're getting about all of this is indeed a limited hangout. I don't know exactly how. And to be honest with you, They've gotten to the point with with everything that's gone on in the last two years. And hopefully more and more people are going to see what they've done financially in the last couple of years. They've shifted so much wealth, once again, in huge ways the last couple of years. I believe at this point in time, they they can't. they can't go back. I know we've got a really short memory. We tend to forget really fast. You know, give us some pizza and a good movie, and all of a sudden, ah, oh, it's the what? What did they do? I forgot. But right now, I think we're just really at a point where they they can't back up from this. This is not going to happen. So it's not just that, and this is why I say we we have to look for it in everything going to bring to your attention Exhibit B. This is a channel called Stolen History, Lifting the Veil of Deception. As of now, and they just released, well, not just, but fairly recently, released this uh, Stolen History uh, Part 3. They have uh, 1, 2, and 3. And I have watched portions of, of each one. I've, I've watched enough of each one to know basically who they are and what they're seeking to accomplish. And now they have a trailer out for, it's called The Secret War Against uh, Germania. And there is a lot of controlled opposition pulling limited hangouts in the whole uh, genre of World War II revisionism or early 20th century revisionism. Lots of them. Because there are certain cats from then they cannot risk letting out of the bag. Why? Because it would dissolve a veil that even, even the, uh, you know, just take like uh, uh, an organization like IHR, Institution for Historical Research, or Review, I'm sorry, Review, 
main body of information that they have taught, that they have uh, produced, that they have verified, that they have upheld for years, a lot of that actually helps to keep the structure of power in place. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear that. And I know a lot of people are vehemently against the questioning of the the character of um, the intentions of uh, Mr. A. H. And most of you know who I'm referring to. The problem is this: when you get like that, like some of my friends, there there are people who I, I think very well of because I think they're decent people out there in the the realm of um, we'll say alternative research or research we should say just research honest research that um, I, I very much like these people I, I think highly of them but they have really put Mr. A.H. and his fellows in uh, an area of their research which is sort of an untouchable area and I think that's remarkably dangerous to do um, it's one of the reasons I spent so much time in bringing it all together talking about the, the the divide between uh, the monarchies and it's not just the monarchies it's a certain class of people because they're a different tribe of people they're different tribes of people than the people they rule it's why there's so much agreement between these people to this day people who are supposed to be at odds with one another at war with one another yet there's so much good equitable treatment between these people and such bad and negative treatment of the people. Now you will get folks coming along every once in a while like Trump who is indeed um, really just a plant. He is a sort of straw man. They can use him to attack his I'm sorry, his gullible, brainwashed constituency. That's what he's there for. And he's also there to mislead them. And he may be misleading them in ways that seem very good for them for a time. He wouldn't be popular if he wasn't leading them in ways that are very beneficial to them for a time. You have to consider that, for one thing, when you're considering Mr. A. H. I just think it's a bad idea to close the door and put him and his, his cohort in an untouchable zone. It's just a bad idea. There's still questions. So... Something like this stolen history and Iwar Annan did this and a lot of other people out there are doing this too. These videos, which are getting huge views, hugely popular, very popular, being pushed in, in you know, alt research, Tataria mud flood sort of research, which those, when we talk about terminology, those terms, Tartaria and Mud Flood, were inserted from the start, uh, just like a reset in the 1800s. These are inserted terms from the start to lock our minds back away in their prison. You have to challenge these people on every assertion, and these people assert things like, and I see it all the time, they'll say, well, we know that this architecture is Tartarian. You do! You know that. How do you know that? How can you prove that that is Tartarian? How can you prove what Tartaria is, that that architecture uh, originated there and spread from there? How the hell are you able to prove this? Show me the documents. The 
best somebody could show you is a similarity. But there's a lot of reasons for that similarity, which I address in bringing it all together. This is how the limited hangouts work. This is how the gatekeeping works. And I'm telling you, I'm not going to talk about this until it's time because this is going to be really big. There are phantom repeats for anybody who's familiar with Fomenko and similar work. Or uh, Emmett Scott's a Guide to the Phantom Dark Age. The idea of phantom repeating, it actually has uh, a lot of strength to it. Because what you can do is you can take uh, very authentic sorts of, of records, histories, and you can apply them to uh, nations, peoples, events of a different time and blend them together in a way that seems very strong. But when you start picking at it, like... Again, I mentioned in bringing it all together, the phantom repeat, or actually, as one of the viewers corrected me, it was indeed a phantom prepeat. They said that the event that happened after the death of Yusho, when, when, when mostly establishment and alternative, everybody says that that event actually happened first hundreds of years before, under uh, this Antiochus Epiphanes IV, and then it happens again after the death, burial, resurrection of Yusho, that's a phantom prepeat, and there's no evidence uh, that would lead us to believe it happened twice. There are, I'm finding, I started seeing when I was working on bringing it all together, there are phantom repeats, prepeats, however you want to say, doubles, phantom doubles that have been employed concerning um, events and nations in our very, very recent history that none of these people that are getting attention, for good reason, that none of these people that are getting attention in alternative research, Tartaria, Mudflow, whatever you want to call it, are talking about. They never, ever talk about these very, very obvious, very, very strong phantom doubles. And I'm going to. I'll give you a hint. One of the hints you can find in bringing it all together, where I identify... One of the two kingdoms that made up the second great hegemonic world kingdom was indeed called Paris. Not Persia, Paris. We see this in the name of so many locations, for one thing, in the north of Europe, in the north and northwest of Europe. We have every indication based on um, the, the French's uh, interactions with certain other kingdoms, specifically how much of a presence they had over in East Asia and for how long. Everything adds up to really um, support them being that uh, half part, the stronger half part of that second hegemonic world kingdom. But there's more. There's a lot more that they've done, and it all has to do with the actual biblical kingdoms that existed and North America. It's coming, and none of them talk about that. They're doing limited hangouts, and they're distracting. They're deflecting. They're keeping people very interested, too, because it's all very interesting topics, but they're only letting just so much hang out. Okay, so there's that, and hopefully this won't take long either. This is um, this concerns terminology. This part's it's really important. There's not enough time to talk about it. I am going to guarantee you that from this point forward, you are going to 
almost never, unless it's in the context of a religion, specifically a religion, specifically a religion that adheres to teachings from the Talmud, the Zohar, maybe um, uh, rabbinic teachings. Or if it's a mistake, it's just a slip up, I say it because I've been hearing it and using it my whole life. Unless it's one of those, you are not going to hear me say the J, the E, the W word. Why? Because of what I just said. That word is an extraordinarily incorrect and deceptive word. There's a lot of reasons why. A lot of reasons why. One reason is too many different, distinctly different tribes of people fall under that banner of the J to the E to the W. Ashkenazim. Distinctly different than Sephardim. But you wouldn't know it if you only looked in a cursory way because the establishment, those out there deceiving and ruling by, you know, cowardly secrecy, they want to put in front of you the idea that Sephardim are mostly well, what they'll do is they'll confuse the Sephardim with Latinos and Latino because sort of language and there have there are a number of uh, a number of people and peoples that they spawned in the Americas and the Eastern Americas that actually bear their surnames that have become sort of more known as Sephardim than the actual Sephardim and this is why I tried to point that out again in bringing it all together this is why I talked about the topics I talked about in bringing it all together, because they're so important. And one of those things is distinguishing and stop using the J word. Start using Sephardim, Ashkenazim, Mizrahi. I mean, we can even say like Yemeni, you know, things like that. And there are others. For instance, there's the Karaites. Now, a lot of people would think, well, the Karaites are just a type of belief system. They're just a religion within, you know. I don't believe that that's entirely true, in fact. Um, I have a building amount of reasons, increasing amount of reasons, to regard them as the descendants of the Karaites with an E instead of an A. Karaites of the areas of Russia. Karaites, the, you know, that claim to keep strictly Torah, no Talmud, no Zohar. I mean, how true and accurate that is as far as what they, you know, I don't know, but I'll tell you something. They, they're, they, they, they haven't historically been treated very well by why would that be i would say for one reason being because they're they're more lawful <laughs> honestly it, the mohammedan the 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 muslim is more lawful than the talmudist <clears throat> excuse me than the Tal i just want to take a drink of coffee Terminology is very important. And I know I use that term a lot in bringing it all together. I didn't, I didn't think that if I started using the specific tribal names, Sephardim, Ashkenazim, Mizrahi, even Kerry, I thought that was probably just going to confuse people more. People have a hard enough time understanding things like, you know, not all white people, not all Western European white people are the same. We're very different, very different, physically different. The way we think and act is different. People 
honestly, I think it's because they don't know both or they just don't want to see it. They honestly treat the French like they're just like the Germans, which I think is honestly crazy. You're not paying attention if you think that. Um, these are clearly different kinds of people. You know, I think the kinds, they do actually come from a limited gene pool, which is not a bad thing. And and it actually creates these tribes, and they're very distinct, and they're different. They have certain features. They have certain behaviors and stuff. And because of that, it's so important. Now listen, I do, I do have some Ashkenazim that actually that come here that watch the channel. The first person that actually helped me advance a great deal in my understanding of of the Hebrew language and and how modern Hebrew isn't the same as biblical Hebrew and just other things and a lot of things actually helped me do a lot of uh, finding, digging, looking into, and so on and so forth. I could throw ideas back and forth to this person was, you know, and they weren't a Sephardim. The Sephardim aren't even the same race or type of people that the Ashkenazim are. They're a different kind of people altogether. It's very clear. I would have thought that would be very clear in their looks, but so much mixing has been done, especially in America in, you know, a century or two. A lot of it on purpose, by the way, via the plans, the designs of the Sephardim. I would think any Ashkenazim uh, listening to this would not want to take the credit or the blame for the slave trade, would you? But you're getting it because everybody thinks when they think J to the E to the W, they think what? Almost universally, they think of the Ashkenazim. Whereas the Sephardim is radically different. Their features, who they are, what they think like, what they act like. Those were the lords of the slave trade. Those are the lords of finance. Yes, there are plenty of Ashkenazim in, in many uh, very visible power positions and um, privileged positions. Why do you suppose that is? Do you think if you were somebody who wanted to put the onus of blame onto another people and you wanted the rest of the world to perceive this certain um, people, let's say a people was known as this specific term, if a people was known as J-E-W, and you didn't want people to think of you and your tribe, you might contrive to put another tribe of people into certain privileged positions who you knew they would occupy, and you probably knew they would play ball. And maybe they had um, been doing these things for some time. Now, this isn't to suggest necessarily that... Um, the Ashkenazim are any different, better, or worse than a tribe of people that would be put in a certain position. I think most people who would be put in certain privileged positions um, would take them and would run with it. And in fact, I know it because I've seen it. This isn't suggesting, this isn't to suggest that there's something, you know, more massively evil or wrong or, you know, with them than other people types. I'm trying to tell you somebody has perpetrated a gigantic fraud. And if we are not willing to consider what the possible parameters of that and how deep it goes, and why would it go that deep? Because for one thing, the people that we are dealing with are very intelligent. They may be cowards, but they're very smart. And I don't even pretend 
to fully understand their designs because I don't have the perspective yet that these people have held for generations and generations. And maybe for extremely long lives. Because the thing is, these people are invisible. They're invisible. If the visible ones that they make sure are in our view are living a hundred plus years, how long do you think they're living? There's no cap that I'm aware of on how long a man could potentially live. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the quote that's taken from Genesis 6 is, is oftentimes misinterpreted, about 120 years. I think that was 120 years from that point forward until this great catastrophe. I don't think that's just lifespan. So, But listen, with that, I'm at 45 minutes again. It's okay, whatever. And my son, he's up, he's playing, he's getting really loud. And I don't feel like going and telling him not to because it's the morning, he's playing, he's having fun. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Take care.